I need you to fix his suit. The suit is literal perfection. It will be. When it fits a woman. Okay, let's get this over with. I have been talking about making this video here and there in my other videos. So best just to take care of it so I can move on to other projects. Let's start with the history of the character in question. For those of who don't know, the identity of Batwoman was created in 1956 in the aftermath of the attacks on comics in the early 1950s as the first of several characters that would make up the Batman family. This was because of Frederick Wertham, a German-American psychiatrist who had written a book about comic book superheroes damaging the youth by painting Batman and Robin as a gay couple. Because the Comics Code Authority kept Catwoman from being written as a love interest to Batman, Batwoman aka Kathy Kane was created to fill this role along with an early version of Batgirl by the name of Beth Kane to be Robin's possible girlfriend. Then Barbara Gordon's Batgirl was created and Kathy Kane's Batwoman was eventually killed off with the Betty Kane Batgirl being changed to Flamebird after the Crisis on Infinite Earths reboot at the DC Universe. So the first Batwoman was gone, and both Batgirls were allowed to go on, up until The Killing Joke and John Ostrander's Suicide Squad run, where Barbara Gordon was changed into Oracle. But the character of Batwoman was gone, and thought forgotten, up until 2006's 52 series, which introduced the Kate Kane version of Batwoman, the one I will be talking about in this video, into the post-Infinite Crisis DC Universe as a supporting character in Renee Montoya's story arc to become the next question. When it comes to my opinion on the comic book version of Kate Kane's Batwoman, I was pretty much okay with the character. Created by Jeff Johns, Grant Morrison, Greg Rucka, Mark Wade, and Keith Giffen, they are the ones created in Wikipedia. Kate seemed to me as a non-offensive character where her sexuality as a lesbian seemed to be the only thing everyone too lazy to read comics were interested to complain about. Also, the timing for her introduction couldn't have been better, as 52 series was known as the year without Batman, Superman and Wonder Woman as they were recovering from the events of Infinite Crisis. Batman needed psychological recovery from having created a robot army that killed millions. Superman had lost his powers after flying through a red sun and an asteroid field made of kryptonite, and Wonder Woman was on an apology tour after killing Maxwell Lord or something like that. Anyway, because Gotham had been left without Batman, Robin and Nightwing, it was perfectly okay for Batwoman to fill in for their absence, and actually, Nightwing did pop in Gotham during that year to check up on her and give his formal approval for doing a good job, before Batman and Robin came back to give her the gold star for covering for them, along with a reform Two-Face and Cassandra Cain's Batgirl, who Batman had left in charge. And that is the basic rundown how we ended up with Kate Cain's Batwoman becoming an existing character in the DC Universe. Now let's get down to the CW's adaptation and why it's a character assassination when compared to everything that came after the 52 series and before the show began to influence the source material. <sighs> when Batwoman was first announced to be making her entrance to the CW Arrowverse, or just the CW verse as it's officially called now, I questioned the circumstances in which she would come to be. As I brought up in the ongoing character history, Batwoman is a supporting character who is supposed to exist alongside the Batman family, but so far the CW verse had not made any references to Batman's existence in the universe of the CW shows. It was explained in the Elseworlds event of 2018 that Batman had existed in hiding, but was now gone, with Batwoman having taken over protecting Gotham from him. That was the first red flag. More red flags rose up with the first trailers giving the viewing audience a glimpse of what the show was going to be about, especially when they showed that the character of Kate Kane would become Batwoman by finding her cousin Bruce Wayne's Batman equipment and fixing them to fit her. 
This was a huge red flag for both comic book readers and casual audiences, as it automatically painted Kate Kane as someone who stole someone else's stuff and declared them her own, whereas in the comics, Batwoman Elegy to be exact, it was shown that she had her own equipment built along with her own Batcave instead. Speaking of Elegy, that comic book storyline was said to be the basis of the first season. I have recently needed to reread it a couple of times to get a proper grasp of the narrative provided by the weird panel arrangement by H.J. Williams III's and Dave Stewart's art in the first to third before Kate's backstory was told in the second third. I'll go more into the comic when I start comparing the characters in the show to their comic book counterparts, but the main thing to bring up is the chosen antagonist in Red Alice, or just Alice as she's called in the show, and the Wonderland gang that does not include Jeremy Stetch, aka the Mad Hatter, in either the comic or the show. There is also something I realized when I was writing the script for this video. When I realized that the CWverse timeline, given with the first season and the previous Elseworlds crossover that introduced Batwoman. The Elseworlds crossover took place in 2018, during which Kate was supposed to have been Batwoman long enough to be a seasoned vigilante by that point. The first four episodes are supposed to take place before Elseworlds in establishing her origin story and rivalry with Alice, with the fifth episode forward having caught up after that crossover. However, I looked and didn't find any good streamline in the timeline to 2019 with the other CWverse shows, meaning that the first eight episodes before the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover are supposed to be spread out to an over-year-long time span, instead of going week to week as I saw them when I sat down to watch the show from HBO Nordic. Here, look at this crap I drew. Episodes 1 through 8 are supposed to be set in 2018, and episode 9 forward, which is the second part of the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover, is set in December 2019, and then 2020 for the rest of the season. WHAT HAPPENED DURING THIS GAP? This show had 12 writers, one of them being the show's main developer for television, and none of them got the memo about the timeline between Elseworlds, the first season, and the Crisis on Infinite Earths event. 12 writers, and apparently no showrunner or continuity editor, to make sure the narrative was coherent. And now let's get into how the CW dropped the ball with the Batman characters in this show. Okay, I mentioned earlier that Kate Kane's Batwoman was created by five people. Jeff Johns, Grant Morrison, Greg Rucka, Mark Wade, and Keith Giffen, who were the main writers of the 52 series where she debuted. However, Batwoman Elegy is credited to have been solely written by Greg Rucka, so the other four's co-creator status is probably best left to her introduction as a supporting character. As a character created by a committee, however, Elegy had Kate appear as Batwoman in the first third of the storyline, and then in the second third is entirely focused on the flashbacks showing her life from the tragic childhood trauma to the point where her dad suggested that she wears a bat on her chest. The diverging point between the comic book version of Kate and the TV version of Kate, played by Ruby Rose, is the earliest point in their lives that in their childhood at the age of 12. In the comic, the childhood trauma that set Kate on the path to become Batwoman was the kidnapping of her, her twin sister Beth, and their mother Gabrielle by a terrorist group in Brussels, Belgium. Kate's father, Jacob, was stationed there as a NATO-assigned colonel, and he led the rescue mission that only recovered Kate from the terrorist group. She saw, when being rescued, a body of a young girl under a blanket, which left her with the impression that her sister was dead. Colonel Kane, however, did still know that the terrorists had Beth, but kept the information from Kate, 
and didn't tell her as he never managed to find her. In the TV show, this tragedy was changed into a traffic accident over a bridge connected to a chase between Batman and the Joker, with the Dark Knight forced to prioritize on his arch nemesis instead of helping the people in the car dangling at the edge. Kate managed to get out of the car, held suspended by a wire shot by Batman, but the structure into which the other end of the wire was holding onto gave in, thus not supporting the car anymore, and resulting to Kate's sister and her mother falling off the bridge before they got out. This first difference between the two Kates focuses on the driving force in her path to becoming Batwoman. The comic book version was a victim who needed to be saved, and thus she saw herself needing to grow stronger, while the TV version was given an obsolete reason to blame Batman for leaving her family to die, in addition to feeling guilty over her own survival. The next difference comes in her military training and discharge due to her sexuality as a lesbian. When the comic book version of Kate was anonymously accused of violating Article 125, aka the Homosexual Code of Conduct, during her training as a cadet, she was respectfully and privately given the chance by her brigade tactical officer to tell him what he needed to hear so she could stay in the military demoted and graduate. Kate, however, refused to lie and violate the honor code of the academy, instead admits to being a lesbian and is forced to leave the academy. When giving this news to her father Jacob, he understands and supports her, affirming that she had upheld her honor and integrity. The TV version has neither honor or integrity. In the TV show, Kate and her fellow cadet were caught by a superior officer, both in full uniform making out in the base area, unlike how in the comic, they were shown in their civilian clothes outside of the base. They were both given the same deal as the comic book version of Kate was, but the TV Kate was cocky and snooty with confidence that as a top cadet at the academy, she would not be kicked out. So she defiantly decided to come out of the closet while her girlfriend took the deal which led to their breakup. As for her father's reaction, more about that later. Then there is the most offending difference between the comic book version and the TV version I already brought up earlier. How the TV version of Kate stumbles her way into the Bat Bunker, I'm going to call it that because it's located under the Wayne Enterprises building and not under the Wayne Manor, so it's not Bat Cave. And tells Lucius Fox's son to fix the, quote, literal perfection bat suit, unquote, to be able to fit a woman so it can be perfect in Kate's mind. AKA the fact that the TV version of Kate takes Batman stuff for herself in order to begin her career as Batwoman, while the comic book version worked with her father in building their own Batcave in their own house and building their, her own Batsuit and other equipment. Finally, there is the way how Kate's sexuality as a lesbian is treated between the two versions. As I said before, I was never bothered by Kate's sexuality in the comics because it was only one part of her character, brought up only here and there when the situation called for it, like the before-mentioned military academy incident and the relationships she had with women in her free time. But in the show, Kate's sexuality is dragged front and center almost every time as if to remind an Alzheimer patient so they don't forget. The worst offender of this comes across in the episode 10 titled How Queer Everything Is Today, which centers around a teenager who got outed to her parents by her ex and tries to get money to leave town by blackmailing people with her hacking skills. Also, she causes a literal train wreck. Now, I have nothing against this character, Parker as her name is, and I can understand that some people in the LGBTQ plus community who live in the closet, have trouble coming out on their own, and suffer when they get outed by means out of their control. She was acting irrationally and out of desperation because she didn't see any other way to get through the situation. 
it is how Batwoman, both the show and the character, handle the situation that is the problem by using Parker's situation and sexuality as an excuse of letting her go free like a dog from a wicket without making her face any consequences from her actions. Her life got hard because she was outed. Yes, cool motive, but she still committed crimes and almost got a train full of people killed. She should be reprimanded by a court of law, not absolved and let go free for being gay. It comes across as a conflicting message when she is told to be oppressed for her sexuality, while also having the privilege of not facing any consequences because of her sexuality. And then at the end of the episode, Kate has Batwoman give out an interview to have her vigilante identity also outed as a lesbian to the public. I'll get into why this is stupid later, but so far I think I have given enough comparative examples in how the main character of the CW's Batwoman was adapted badly when compared to the source material. And now to the supporting characters. Luke Fox, aka Batwing, was not in Elegy or 52, as he was created in 2013 during the new 52, and didn't work with Batwoman until James Dewey and the Ford's Detective Comics run, which I will talk about later. The difference between the comic version and the TV version played by Cambridge Johnson is that the former was already a tech suit wearing vigilante working with the Batman family, and the latter is not during the entire 20 episode season showing any signs of becoming this. The only thing that they have in common is their name and who their father is. Luke's only reason for being in this show is to be the Alfred surrogate. Oh, and Lucius Fox is dead, by the way. General Jacob Kane. It is probably for the lack of imagination and attempting to copy Quentin Lance from Arrow's early seasons that Kate's father, Jacob Kane, played by Dougry Scott, is no longer a United States general working with and supporting his daughter's vigilante activities role, which was given to Luke, as I previously stated, but rather a commander of a private security force trying to take her out without knowing that Batwoman is his daughter, whereas in the comics it was Jacob's idea for Kate to wear a bat symbol on her costume to let people she came across to know whose side she was on. As for how the relationship as a father and daughter is portrayed, it's like it has been purposely made worse with him being overprotective and her being defiant. That pride his comic book counterpart had for his daughter after she got kicked out of the military academy, that is given to a completely different character. Sophie Moore, played by Megan Tandy, is a character with whom I need to give some credit to the TV show's writing team. Some, not a lot. Sophie in the comics was more of a one-time use character by being the cadet with whom Kate was caught violating the homosexual conduct. The difference between the two versions is that the comic book version was not accused along with Kate, meaning that she got to graduate and go to have a military career outside of Kate's life. And the TV version was caught with Kate, meaning that she was given the same deal Kate was, took it by lying about being gay, and went to become Jacob Kane's second in command in his security firm, while also being married to another male security agent. When I said that I need to give the show some credit, it's not for much, and I also pretty much need to take it right back. The credit goes to taking a one-time use character and properly extending her story from her single appearance, but all of that is done at the expense of Kate's relationship with her father. That pride and praise that Jacob gave Kate when she came home from the academy, it's given to Sophie instead. Mary Hamilton, played by Nicole Kang, is someone I originally assumed to be an original character created for the show, 
but apparently she does indeed have a comic book counterpart in Flamebird, aka that pre-Barbara Gordon Batgirl I mentioned when recapping the character history for Batwoman at the beginning of the video. Meaning that I will be taking back what I said about her in my first Stargirl review, about her being a replacement character for someone else. She was probably the only supporting character I didn't find annoying or frustrating most of the time, probably as she was the token not-gay female character, so I might have even found her attractive. In retrospect, however, just like with Luke's case, I saw no hints towards her walking towards becoming Flamebird, other than her learning Kate's secret and trying to eventually convince her to let her work with her, like at the end of Elegy. Julia Pennyworth. I don't know what I should say about this character, other than that some news outlets like the Marisu got into a hissy fit over the casting of Christina Wolf, a blonde Caucasian woman, when the most recent version of the character from Scott Snyder's Batman Eternal miniseries was portrayed as biracial. I did not very much care about this, as I had a much bigger beef with the fact that she was the closest link to the MIA Batman through her father, Alfred, but nowhere in the episode she appeared in didn't she mention where her father was during everything that was happening. I need to say this right out of the gate. Rachel Scarsten is one of the best actors they hired for this show, and that unfortunately is a two-headed sword. When you have too much of a good thing, that good thing ends up cannibalizing the rest of the show. I'm serious. Alice is too much overused and ends up taking screen time from other villains' development used in the show, and because her status as an at-large criminal needs to be justified somehow. Unfortunately, that somehow is her being born as Beth Kane, Kate's twin sister, and that makes Batwoman emotionally compromised in apprehending her. Which means that she keeps letting her go in every episode they face off. This would not have been a problem if the writers had had enough restraint to keep the reveal of her identity up until episode 3 or 4, which would have been as long as it took in Elegy for Alice to tell Batwoman that they both have their father's eyes. And that was during their third encounter, after Batwoman had been shown competently treating Alice as a criminal instead of as her sister. I also find it forced that the military-grade security firm, along with the GCPD, is unable to catch the nerfed version of the Wonderland gang led by Alice, that again, does not include Mad Hatter as brains. Mouse, aka a male version of Jane Doe, is a gender-bent character in the show as the result of Gates and Beth's childhood event changed from a terrorist kidnapping to a bridge accident. After falling off the bridge, Beth was found by Mouse's father and he kept her hostage for 15 or so years. They are the reason why Beth became Alice, and Mouse's maid gimmick is almost the same as with Jane Doe in the comics. To impersonate other people with masks made from human skin tissue. Which leads us to maybe one of the biggest insults to a Batman villain twice in one year! Hey, how many of you watched that animated adaptation of Batman Hush storyline that came out last year, where the twist was that, spoiler alert, it was the Riddler instead? That movie was the first smack at Hush's reputation, and this show followed up with the hold my beer attitude. Played by Gabriel Mann, this guy is not the philosophy quoting neurosurgeon, who spent most of his life planning revenge on Bruce Wayne because his father Thomas saved his mother's life from a car crash Hush had orchestrated as a child. Instead, he is turned into a wall-building real estate shark who wants to, quote, 
make Gotham safe again, unquote. Before I move on, I need to say two things. One, I do not live over here, and I'm tired as a foreigner of hearing unoriginal, recycled complaints disguised as jokes about who inspired Mr. Garrison from South Park to run for the President of the United States. F*** them all to death! Let's make this country great again! And two, I did not vote for this man back in 2018, and I have accepted that I'm stuck with him as my president until 2024. With that out of the way, all of Hush's original agency as a villain has been taken away from him because the TV show was too obsessed using Alice too much. Becoming Hush in the first place, because Alice got him captured in his first encounter with Batwoman. Reason for of acting as Hush? Because Alice caused him to become a wanted man and needing a new face. How does he get his new face? Which, by the way, in the comics he operated on himself. From Alice and Mouse for working as a henchman for them. Oh, and the face he gets? In the comics, Hush made himself look like Bruce Wayne so he could steal his identity and fortune. While in the show, Alice needs him to look like Bruce Wayne, played by Warren Christie, so he can walk in the Wayne Enterprises and steal a really stupid plot device that I will talk about later. Hush has been reduced into a henchman whose vitality is so low that in a one-on-one -on -one fight against Batwoman, he can go down with just one punch or just one scratch from a batarang. And after the previously mentioned animated movie, this portrayal in this show is like kicking someone already down on the ground. Magpie. This character is pretty much a carbon copy of that Catwoman surrogate from that Beware the Batman CGI cartoon from 2013. I have nothing else to say about her. Nocturna, not actually a vampire, just a villain of the week. Joker's daughter, aka Duella Dent. This character was pretty much just another filler villain of the week, who was only used to give Alice a new face to use, and to establish that Harvey Dent never became Two-Face in the CW-verse. Where do I begin? What is the first differentiating factor between the show's Batman and the comic book version? The three-year absence from Gotham before Kate became Batwoman instead of being gone just one year during the 52 series. His role in causing Kate's sister and mother's accident instead of a terrorist group. A decade-long age gap between him and his cousins. Or maybe I should go with how Kate's first canonical encounter with Batman is what shaped her view of him. As I said earlier, the show makes Batman responsible for the car accident which caused Kate's mother her life and her sister being turned into Alice. In the comics, this would not have happened since Kate and Bruce are closer to being same age, so he would not have been Batman yet when this happened. The first time Kate ever saw Batman, it was maybe a year after she had been kicked out of the military academy after a bad bar night when she was almost assaulted on her way home, but managed to keep herself safe. Batman had witnessed this and moved in to help, but stopped seeing that she didn't need it. When Kate saw Batman standing behind her, she was startled and fell off her feet, to which Batman responded by helping her back up before leaving to continue his patrol. And watching Batman make his exit into the night, that was the moment that inspired Kate to become Batwoman as a disgraced soldier's new way to serve again. That is how Kate should have seen Batman, and should have been the reason that led her to the training she was shown doing at the beginning of the pilot episode. 
And she should have made herself become Batwoman without any influences from Batman, without knowing who he was. I say this using the beginning of James Dewey and the Ford's Detective Comics run from 2016, which is where Bruce Wayne and Kate Kane were retconned into being cousins, and Bruce approached Kate as an equal and as one of his remaining family members. I saw this as a positive development at the time, as it showed Bruce moving away from his childhood trauma, and developing as a character by opening up to his life outside of his vigilante activities. Anyway, prior to this point, Kate was essentially her own self-made vigilante, even when she had gotten help from her father, who worked independently outside of the Batman family. And by Tuvian Ford's Detective Comics run, Batman had come to see her as worthy of being brought into the family as an equal. Not better or worse, but as an equal. Which leads us to a great big smack on the face. I did not like or enjoy the CW's Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover. At best, it was pretty much just fan service with returning actors from old DC shows and movies for nostalgia's sake. And at worst, those actors were pretty much just showing up so we could see their characters be killed off. Bert Ward's Dick Grayson from the 1966 Batman show. Dead and gone! Ashley Scott's Helena Wayne from the 2013 Birds of Prey TV show. Dead and gone! Tom Wellings and Erica Durance's Clark Kent and Lois Lane from Smallville. Give it a few minutes after their scenes are over, and they will be dead and gone. John Wesley ships Barry Allen from the 1990s Flash TV show. He just shows up so Grant Gustin's special needs Flash doesn't have to die. But the most insulting thing the crossover did was giving Kevin Conroy, the most defining Batman voice actor, have an on-screen live-action role OH MY GOD as an elderly Bruce Wayne WHO IS JUST THERE TO BE KILLED OFF OH SHIT Now, I can understand why Kevin Conroy's screen time was limited. He is a voice actor, and he himself has confessed that when doing his Batman performance, he just closes his eyes and channels his emotions when reading his lines. That is not how on-screen actors work. And he also said that he needed ad-set coaching from the other actors so he could portray his character with what he was given. That is alright, and otherwise I understand these limitations. But what I did not understand, or cannot accept, is the material he was given to work with. Essentially, what Kevin Conroy was made to portray was the equivalent of an evil Batman originated from the Dark Multiverse. He was built up to being one of the greatest paragons to save the multiverse, but then he was just revealed to be a broken man both mentally and physically who had killed his world Superman for reasons worse than in Batman v Superman has the power to wipe out the entire human race and if we believe there's even a 1% chance that he is our enemy we have to take it as an absolute certainty Clark Clark always said yes to anyone with a badge or a flag he gave them too much power was waiting to die after failing in his life's mission and what is then killed off in an unbelievably lazy way, being shoved into the bad computer's desktop and electrocuted because technology plus body harness when added force equals death via electricity. I know that after Brandon Routh was revealed to be shown as a Kingdom Come inspired Superman, the expectations were high for Kevin Conroy to be shown as the Kingdom Come inspired Batman which he kind of was, since he had a similar body harness. But we should have seen that it was not in the budget. What was in the budget was having him be an evil Batman that Batwoman could kill, take his place as a paragon, and self-validate herself to be better than all the versions of her cousin. 
What a waste of a beloved voice actor. Robin or Nightwing does not make an appearance, but a mention is made of him to prove he does indeed exist. Arrowverse.fandom.com also has an article to confirm that the character should be out there, but it is possible that Crisis on Infinite Earth Red can't him away. That being said, I find this kind of reference by mention to be insulting, because it is essentially an empty promise of we know what you want, and we can confirm that they are out there, but nah, we are not going to use them. Enjoy this small fan service. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my god. The political agenda, for the lack of better words, is best embodied in Rachel Maddow's, whoever she is, I don't know, character. This is not Vesper Fairchild. The only thing they got close to her comic book counterpart is that she was a radio talk show host, and after that, the writing team just gave her character to Rachel Maddow's is she some useless political activist celebrity over there in the US? So they can have a bad commentator criticizing Batwoman's actions and romanticize them to Batman in a seriously tone death way. I say tone death because she makes Batman of the past sound like Adam West type celebrity who walked among the citizens as the bright knight of Gotham instead of the Dark Knight detective who was feared by the criminal element. Like, for example, after Batwoman gives the interview where she comes out of the closet, Sophie's old-fashioned mother comes to tell her still-in-the-closet daughter that she found Batman better, or cuter, because he supported slash represented old-fashioned values that Batwoman does not completely ignoring the fact that Batman would be HATED for all the collateral damage his war against Gotham's criminals caused. I believe from everything said on her radio show to be more from real-world fans who have read comics or watched the movies instead of coming from actual Gothamites who have lived through Batman's decade and a half in the CW-verse and whose worst day in their life would be when they came across Batman. What makes the use of this character even more insulting is that Vesper Fairchild was killed off in the comics by the women in refrigerators trope, and instead of properly utilizing her alive in live action, she was pretty much just weakened at Bernie's around as a mouthpiece. And then there is the poor Slam Bradley, whose comic book counterpart is an old man and a hard-boiled detective story protagonist like Jussi Vares, who is changed into a male model moonlighting as a police officer. Police officer who, at the wrong place at the wrong time, rescues Batwoman from an incoming projectile and that alone makes everyone in Gotham think that you have an affair. These ramifications are only shown from Gates' point of view, not Slam's, and that is why Batwoman had to come out of the closet in a tabloid interview. It's not like a secret identity is supposed to be secret, so that no one knows about it, and it can remain as a secret identity. That is why it was stupid. While I was still in the early stages of writing the script for this video, I was approached by one of my subscribers on Discord who asked me, quote, What the heck did they do to Batman in the Arrowverse? It's like they completely trashed him, unquote. The best I was able to explain to her was that they had made Batwoman be a bad legacy character whose shortcomings were covered by making Batman look worse, or just as bad, along with the poorly attempted differentiation from Arrow, where Green Arrow was shown as a wannabe Batman through the eight seasons long show. Her response was that she has come to despise Batwoman because of what she has seen, 
and would have rather just had Batman instead of Batwoman. And so, what kind of impact has Batwoman made on the CW for the comic book fans and the general viewing audiences? Last year when the show was making its rounds on television, I followed a couple of YouTubers who reviewed each episode weekly as they were coming out. Half of them were the intended target audience, one of them identified as a member of the target audience, only half of them committed themselves to reviewing the show from beginning to end, and none of them saw the show as good. The ones best brought up were Torias Unlimited, with whom I had a small one-sided feud last summer when reviewing Stargirl, and who was very dramatic in explaining how bad the show was, and Jay Longbone, who clearly knew who most of the characters were, and could barely contain her enjoyment laughing at how bad the show was. While Mega Random 42 and Bolstrex few reviews were mostly quick and telling recaps that cut their points across and they were not positive. That brings us to why I decided to make this video in the first place. The CW's Batwoman is a character assassination on the entire Batwoman IP, done via the method best described as if it's not broken, then don't try to fix it. Elegy had a perfect blueprint on how to tell Batwoman's story, but the CW decided to make unnecessary changes to it, which has led us to this situation where everyone now hates, despises and overall laughs at the character. I wanted to bring attention to the source material and how the CW dropped the ball with it. Instead of making yet another this show sucks and I hate it blah 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 video. Just like the Birds of Prey IP with the Birds of Prey and the unnecessary long subtitle including Harley Quinn movie, the Batwoman IP will now forever be tied to this TV show and not to the source material that made the characters successful enough to be adapted for television. If you have been knowledgeable at all of the IP before the TV show, you are now required to make an effort to say, I like Batwoman the comic book character, in order to not come out liking the bad TV show. In the end, the great tragedy of CW's Batman was that it did not get its chance to end properly. Because in the spring of 2020, our world was hit by a pandemic that forced a lot of television and movie productions to halt, Batman being one of them. I have suspected ever since Arrow decided to kill someone off in its fourth season, and decided at the 11th hour for that to be Black Canary, that the CWs does not plan how to end their seasons at the start with, and I suspect the same was the case with Batwoman. They did not plan how to end this first season, and what to do with Kate, Alice, Hush, or anyone else until the very end, and the casting of Warren Christie's Hush's Bruce Wayne face must have been a late add-on. If it was not, then Christie would have been in the show as Batman in the pilot episode's flashbacks, instead of being portrayed by a stunt actor, or be used as Batman more presently in the ways I brought up from Elegy, but no. Batwoman's first season ended to a cliffhanger of Kate accepting that she could never reach out to her father Jacob to work with her as Batwoman, and Alice giving Hush his Bruce Wayne face from the comics, so he can walk into the Wayne Enterprises building and steal kryptonite to, and I'm not making this up, Use as a weapon to, I'm dead serious here, KILL BATWOMAN! Not Superman or Supergirl, but BATWOMAN because apparently Kryptonite is needed to penetrate the Batsuit! WHAT FANFICTION WAS THIS?! Jerry Sandy and Kelly Larson, which one of you came up with this bullshit in the episode that you both wrote? And why did your fanfiction get this high quality production to be shown on television? Well, the best I can hope for is for some good fan audience to find my Pokemon Dark Multiverse fanfic and turn it into a dungeon! Anyway, when I sat down to watch that one from HBO Nordic, the implication from the narrative was that it must have been written as they went on, and that was what led to its downfall. Along with the fact that the main lead, Ruby Rose, 
decided to leave the show, and now Batwoman is due for Yavisia Leslie to have been cast as a new character, Ryan Wilder, to take Kate Kane's place as Batwoman. I have no idea who Yavisia Leslie is, but I know that the character named Ryan Wilder does not exist in the comics, so the soft reboot or reset that will be happening on season 2 might as well be its own separate TV show that has nothing to do with Batwoman. After all this, all I can see in the CW's Batwoman is a lot of wasted potential and character assassinations done for the sake of right as we go narrative and Batwoman's IP in the same waste bin as the Birds of Prey IP after Harley Quinn hijacked them in the movie that came out in February. I also understand why a lot of YouTube personalities such as Mega Random 42, Thorias Unlimited and Heels vs. Babyface were against Stargirl at the beginning of summer, after they had to suffer through all of this. But at least Stargirl had her original creator in Jeff Johns, keeping it from being corrupted by bad writers and passive activists led by personal and individual politics. What I mean by that is just go watch Stargirl instead of any of the CW's formerly branded Arrowverse shows. Stargirl was done better as both an adaptation from the comic and as a TV show on its own. Also feel free to go look up the 52 series and Batwoman elegy for what the CW's Batwoman could have been instead of what it became. Now I want to go do something more positive, but before I leave to do any of that, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe, and may your heart be your guiding key.